You know, I never thought we'd be talking about birds so much here on this show. However, semicolon, comma, it seems that when our ACC teams do well, when ultimately pull off a W, it uh, doesn't go well for the other, other side, and they let them know just quite how they feel. Let's talk about Pitt and Duke and a little other games on today's show. You are Locked On ACC, your daily podcast on the Atlantic Coast Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's edition of Locked On ACC. I'm your host, Candace Cooper, joined by Kenton Gibbs of Locked On Wolfpack. Each and every day, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you download, subscribe to the pod from anywhere, as well as our YouTube page. Join our community where if you talk to us, we certainly love to talk back. It is all good vibes here on this side. We've got a lot to go over on today's show, mainly because there is so much animosity, high energy, high octane when it comes to ACC play. We all know on the men's side, any given night, women's side as well, you can get got, but it seems that it was the kids in Cameron that were very much rowdy after Blake Henson decided to jump on the scores table, let them know just about that dub. And we're going to talk about those feelings and reactions. And what does that mean as we get into further conference and ACC tournament, ACC trying to make some bids happen and standings and all of that good stuff. So welcoming Kenton to the stage. How you feeling big dog? Oh, I'm feeling great as always. I'm, I'm feeling a lot better than the uh, boys in Duke blue because who, I'll tell you, Pitt gave them the blues, and they won't stop crying about it, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah, 100%. Let's get right into things. Probably, arguably, the biggest game of the weekend around the ACC. The Pitt Panthers went to Cameron in Durham, North Carolina, to face off against Duke Blue Devils, and it was a battle. You have no Mitchell. You have no Roach. But Duke still added Filipowski and the rest of the team, and they're also known for winning at home, but it didn't quite go over that well because Pitt just would not let up, and they definitely imposed their will and came away with the victory, 82-76. Let's talk about the game first before we talk about the post game. Yeah, sure. What what would we like to talk about in terms of the game? Because there were so many different storylines going on, so many different things happening in terms of when you looked at that game and said, well, Duke is missing a ton of pieces. So how are they going to react? Well, Filipowski is pretty much their only star to show that's going to be available in this game. So how would they show up? How would they react? And lo and behold, they did not react favorably. They did not react in a way. Are they not five stars? Are they not four stars? Are they not the top players in the country? Is it not show and prove? Is it not max man up? You only got 10 people on the floor. So like, let's put it on there. Do what you got to do. Well, I I agree, but I'm just saying that 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 was not how it was. uh, That was not what shook out. That was not what occurred. And that's not um, the, the situation for Duke is they ended up losing the close one because again, Blake Henson showed up. And he's been Pitt's leading scorer all year, and he did he did his thing again. He mattered down the stretch in this one, and did enough for this team to get them over the hump, get them a huge win on the road, and he he enjoyed himself and celebrating that win a little bit. You know, we've seen teams who go on these skids, right? The four to five to six losses, and it's always like a high time for a W if you are a halfway decent team. And I similarly relate that to Georgia Tech, who ended up beating Clemson. Like it's hard to beat a team that you know knows that their worth, knows that they are due for a win and kind of shows up. And to me, that's similar to what happened here with Pitt and Duke, right? Pitt was on a nice little skid, two and five in the conference and trying to figure out where to go from here. And they certainly wanted to come into a hostile territory where we know Capel has very familiar roots with the Duke of Blue Devil program. And why not come away with a victory? Yeah, and I think the biggest thing here is when you talk about the different storylines coming into this game, the one of the storylines was Coach Capel calling out his team and saying, hey, we need to get tougher. We need to get better. Do beat this team by 20 point, well, 22 points, literally less than two weeks ago. Like that's that's a very real thing that happened. That's a very real thing that we look at in terms of that happening, you know. And, and so this game, again, there are missed players. I'm not going to pretend like you know, there weren't injuries. But at this point in time of the season, a lot of teams are banged up. A lot of teams are missing stars. Guys are hurt. Guys are limping. Guys are injured. You got to figure it out. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think ultimately, like we said, it's a good victory for the Panthers who are trying to figure out their next steps. But let's talk through the post game. Of course, you get the victory. You're feeling good. You're winning in Cameron. Not many can say that they win in Cameron. And here comes Blake Henson jumping on the table to where many of the media members sit. And the fans gave him a nice, well, you know, it's been real. It's been fun, but it hasn't been real fun. And see you later. A couple of read between the lines, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know what the problem is. I really and truly don't. In which understand. regard? Is it bad for the people to react with the way they did, or is it bad that he jumped on the table, or none of it? It's just the nature of the beast. All of it is fair play. Hmm. All of it is fair play to me. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're acting as if the camera crazies just got their nickname for being loud. Mm-hmm. No. That's not where that came from. Don't they pass out sheets? with personal information on these players. Like, oh, this is what to say to get to this. This is what to say to get to this. This is what to say to get to this. Didn't they once chant, and I'm sure all of those kids are graduated and they're in their professional world and and whatever their careers are, but didn't those camera crazies once chant, how's your grandma to a player who lost his grandmother that week? I believe I heard that that rumor. Cannot confirm or deny, but. So. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? You know, like this is. There, I mean, there's a level to winning, right? Like you have to be, you have to have some decorum. You have to just be gracious when you win. You know, you just have to take your win and keep it pushing. Like you can't rile up the crowd. Like what is that? Why? Why would you do that? I I was taught to win with decorum and win with class and act like you've been there before. Pitt only had one winning conference to this point. Had they been there before? Had they been the top ten team? With Capel as the coach before? How many? What's Pitt's record in basketball against top 10 teams? So not only they should have, they didn't act like they've been there before, but maybe they should have been taught a lesson. So when you do win, this is how you're supposed to act. Yes. It's like if you take a certain, well, actually, no. I think I think you let people act how they want to act. And if you don't want to act a certain way, beat them. Mm. Beat them. Because mm. Kyle Filipowski game definitely – you know, shared his sentiments about how he thought it was disrespectful and he didn't appreciate it and things like that. And took it you know, hard. It's hard to take it on the chin about reactions to Blake Henson's jumping on the score table. There's a uh, there's a school in Detroit. It's on East Lafayette. It's called King. Gross, gross place. Gross people. They were our rivals. OK, they were our rivals. We did not like them. We hated them. We if there was any game, if we would have, if somebody would have told us Cash Tech is going to go one and seven, but your one win is over King. Yes, the year was a failure, but at least we beat King. Cool. They beat us my senior year, and they talk, they talk like they ain't never talked before. Oh, all they all five star. Oh, all y'all this, y'all that, y'all talked to us on the way while we were walking back to the bus. Their families were screaming things at us as we walked on the way back to the bus and all that to to leave. And you know what? You know, some of my teammates said, oh, man, they, they just ooh, they just couldn't wait to get a win off against us. Did it. You know what I said as soon as we got on the bus? Of course they were waiting. It's our job to be us. It's our job to do the thing that stops them from having the ability to talk. You know who I've never heard talk? A parent of a son that just got beat by 35. Those, those folks are real quiet. You know who doesn't jump on tables? A team that you beat by 20 again. A team that you beat, period. You can beat them by one point. I guarantee you, Henson wouldn't have been jumping on no table. So if you are so hurt about it, Kyle Filipowski, do something. If you are so hurt about it, John Shire, make the proper adjustments. <laughs> Whoop. There it how do I even say anything after that? You know, that, that perfectly said, Kenton. All right. The regular season of the NFL is wrapped up. Playoffs are here. Kenton is begging y'all to put money down on his Lions by doing it at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. It's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is super easy to use, and there are many different ways to bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a win. FanDuel is the official partner of the NFL. All right, Ken. The Lions are going to do it. Are the Lions going to do it. Absolutely, my Lions are going to do it. Okay, that, that's all there is to it. I have full faith that my Lions get it done today. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, 
when they get it done, don't don't y'all listen to Candace talk about some put money on the game. Ken told you put money on the game because if anything goes awry, you know the refs don't act a little iffy in the Motor City. So don't you dare go up there talk about Ken. I lost my rent money because of you. You ain't do nothing because me. I really feel like they can beat the Bucks, right? They play the Bucks. Oh yeah, they can absolutely beat them. Oh yeah, we beat them earlier this season. But but again, it's hard to beat know, a team twice. You but you know what? And maybe three times. Did it. The, the Ravens just did it, you know. They did. And, and, and they at home again, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, home playoff team's been real good this year. The only team to lose at home in these playoffs is the Cowboys. And I tell folks all the time, stop making fun of them kids for believing in Santa because there are grown men and women that believe in the Cowboys. You that, <laughs> Come on now. They, they've they been alive for 30-some-odd years watching them boys get put off. But that needed here. That's neither here nor there. Now, Duke's lost the top 10 team, of course, losing to, I would, of course, you could argue that it's a bottom feeder team here in our good. conference. They're it's bottom. not not great for the league at the moment. And the one who's holding on for us, I fear, is North Carolina. They're currently undefeated in conference play, picked up a big win, 76-66 against Boston College. You know, a lot of people were talking about the refing and all the things, but, you know, as, you, as long as you come away with the W, I really don't care. You know, you, you got your bar, Barstool, Boston College versus your Barstool, UNC. Everyone's just, you know, getting in their feels. But, hey, you got to win. To talk junk, you got to get the W. You know, I'm going to tell you something. The, the officials are always the problem when you lose, and when you yeah. win, it's always oh well, you know. Yeah, what are you What are you gonna do about the guys and strikes? I, I ain't gonna lie to you. You know, speaking of the lines, like we were talking about earlier, the lines definitely got away with a few calls at the end. Yeah. Definitely got away with a couple of DPIs. I ain't gonna lie about that. Yeah. You know what I mean, hundred percent. But with that being said, it's the same thing in this game, right? Boston College, you have to know that you know North Carolina is they are who you thought they were. Mm -hmm. This is a team that is going to be coming at you with their star power and trying to overwhelm you in that way. And they very much so did in some regard, but even beyond that, North Carolina's role players are stepping up and doing what they're supposed to do. I don't think anybody at this point in time would consider Elliot Cadell a star, but right. he runs and orchestrates that offense extremely well. I don't think anybody at this point in time would consider Harry Ingram a star, but that boy plays that Dennis Rodman role so tough. I, I, he he's, is the heart and soul. He is the heartbeat of yeah, that team. Absolutely. He's the Draymond Green who knows how to keep his hands to himself. I'm, I'm yeah. telling you, the young man just, he goes out there, he defends at a high level. He is always attacking the boards at a high level. If Harry don't do nothing else, that's what he's going to do. They're what are you play. calling him? Harry? Harrison? I'm sorry. Harrison. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. You can't reduce Harrison to Harry no more anyway. Uh, Harrison. Boy, you don't know that boy to be calling him Harry. Go ahead, though. Uh, Oh, let me let me make a real former Mr. Ingram of of the <laughs> University of North Carolina Chapel Hill uh, is he he does what he does spectacularly mm -hmm. and what what the Tar Heels are doing is they're combining players who are stars with players who star in their roles. You have Baycott, you have Davis, you have you know though that those two are your nucleus, but you have everybody else stepping up. You have Cormac Ryan coming in with spacing, with efficiency, with experience, with taking care of the ball. You have Cadeau coming in, running the offense well. You have Ingram coming in. And they don't have to be a super deep team because, again, they're star, star, and everybody else stars in their role. Yeah, 100% agree. I think one – it's a very exciting team to watch in terms of playing for each other. You just feel like it's actually a team and not people who are just hired to come in and sort of put on the North Carolina jersey, do what they do. I think one thing looking forward to, you know, the rest of the season is trying to get that bench some help because we saw long term how that sort of hindered the team that made it to the Final Four championship game when uh, Hubie was in his first season. So let's see how he sort of keeps building on that bench help for them. So let's talk about some other teams that are looking a little shaky right now. Miami and Syracuse. Syracuse coming in, handling business. Quadir Cleveland with a nice game winning three. Miami struggling. I just yeah. did not. I, if you had told me Miami season was going to go like that, like I get that, you know, people move on and graduate, go on to next things, but definitely not yet a reloading program. But you know what? This is why I said what I said in terms of Duke. You have the excuse of people out. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. Miami's leading scorer and rebounder, Norchad O'Meara, was out for this game. I tweeted about it from the Locked On ACC page once it was announced that he'd be out. This is a team that's already struggling, looking to find that that uh, their footing in the conference. And then all of a sudden, it's like, hey, by the way, this player that leads you in multiple statistical categories, he's gone. 
Mm-hmm. So good luck with that. It's a tough year for Larry and the boys, but also credit to Syracuse, right? Syracuse has done what they needed to do in a game like this because it's easy to walk in and have your guard down and say, ah, we're all right. We're good. You know, we're only about two, three games out of first place. And, you know, this team, they're below us anyway. We'll be fine. But they needed to show up and win this game. They needed mm-hmm. to show up and do what had to be done in order to walk away with a win here. And, you know, for for whatever you say about Syracuse and not having quality wins, they have also shown up and avoided really bad losses other than their loss to um, – their loss to UVA. They've shown up and avoided bad losses as well. Yeah, 100% agree there. Let's talk about NC State, Virginia Tech. The Hokies came into Raleigh in a very winnable game for the pack, but sometimes those get you most caught up, and Virginia yeah. Tech held the line and did what they needed to do. You know, like I was just talking about, every game is, oh, yeah, we're, we're comfortable. We can win it. We can do it until you can't. The reality is in this game, NC State got into foul trouble early and they tried to leave some of their better defenders on the floor with a lot of foul trouble and it just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It didn't make sense because if your best defenders have a lot of foul trouble and you know that their best players are good at drawing fouls, you have to allow the blow by or else. And that's that's just the situation there. But on top of that, NC State was terribly sloppy with the ball, turning it over constantly constantly you're not going to win like that and you know Padula and Couture for as much as they were held down early in the game when it mattered most when it was winning time the winner showed up congratulations yeah. Virginia Tech on your first role ACC win of the year because they they got it done in winning time I think a couple things from Keats you know when you talk about just who do you want to be the leader of the pack sometimes these are the games that you're like mm-hmm, Keats I want yeah. it to be you, my guy. Yeah. But some things aren't adding up, as well as number two, just emotional games, right? NC State came off an emotional game against Wake Forest. And I think, like, yes, we want to be the bully, but you also have to hoop. And so, like, figuring out ways to just take the emotions out of it and really get back to the X's and O's and fundamentals is going to be crucial for this program that's still, you know, finding their way, way finding their sea legs and really making a strong run come tournament and postseason time. I 1,000% agree. I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, At the end of the day, you know, that whole like, hey, we buy into NC State culture and, and, you know, we don't care if you call us classics. We don't care if you call us whatever. We're going to do whatever it takes, fighting, scrapping the claw and to get us a win. That's great and all. But the the end of it was fighting, scrapping and clawing to get a win. Mm -hmm. All the other stuff doesn't matter if you don't get a win. And folks won't even matter if you – folks won't even care if you do it in a very – up in the high sedity fashion as long as you're winning. Yeah. That's the important part. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, Keats, I'm telling you right now, you better get them boys in the tournament or else, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That I, I think, I think, I hope this one doesn't come back to haunt because, like, we were talking about bottom feeder. Virginia Tech certainly is one right now, but, right. you know, I hope this loss doesn't come back to bite the Wolfpack who may be on the fringe. Let's talk about Wake Forest and Louisville who got a, a convincing victory over Louisville. We always say you got to beat that one this season. 90 to 65 and Monsanto coming back was certainly, you know, a help, a present help for the Demon Deacons. Finally, they've got someone who is just ready to un- unleash that cannon and it served them very well. You know, this is – I. Number one, with Monsanto back, if he can get healthy and get fully ready to roll, that is probably the best backcourt in the conference. But number two, you have to take care of business, especially against Louisville. That's the reality. I know people don't like hearing us say that. I know folks are going to be upset. Oh, that's my team. And they're Listen, this team is a mess. They're a hot mess. Okay? And – the, the longer you allow them to stick around and play around and all that good stuff, you risk in, ending up like Miami, where they completely blown the, – where the doors blown off Louisville to start this game. No, they hung around for the first half of the first half. And then at about that midway media timeout, all of a sudden, Wake Forest started to find it a little bit, you know. Andrew Carr started to find it a little bit, you know? And then next thing you know, this thing is wide open. They're going into halftime with a 15-point lead. And from there, it was all downhill. It was Katie Dids at the doorstep. 
just have a good time in the second half, and they still won that one. This Louisville team is a train wreck. Wake Forest is trending in the right direction. Good on them. And these last two games here, let's talk about, which I think these are really just two games where these teams reminded themselves of who they were. Clemson beating Florida State 78-67, which is a surprising victory considering how well Florida State has been doing. But good on Clemson for coming back after that Georgia Tech loss and really, you know, getting focused. But the Virginia-Georgia Tech game as well, where Virginia is starting to ride their high, be healthy again, and beat a good, again, a very young and just, you know, wait, wait for them because they're coming Georgia Tech program. You know, this game starts to feel, or not this game, this day starts to feel a little like the witching hour with as many upsets as we saw, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it was just so many teams where it's like, hey, this team was favored. Oh, but they lost. Hey, this team is supposed to win. Oh, but they lost. And this is this uh, Clemson and, and Florida State game was definitely one of them. You're looking at one of the hottest teams in the conference coming into this game. And we've talked ad nauseum about how Clemson is more and more and more a very we're one or two guys, that's who we are type of program. That's who they've been this year. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, you get four guys scoring in double digits in this game. Lo and behold, all of a sudden, all of your starters are shooting at or above 50% or putting up double digit points. This type of stuff is what gets wins. This type of stuff is what takes you to that next level. And I'll tell you what, Florida State being thoroughly dominated on the boards the way they were was probably the biggest thing because it seemed like Clemson just wanted it more. Florida yeah. State had the length, Clemson had the heart and the want to on the boards, and I believe that was the difference in this one. Absolutely agree. So let's get into the standings now. We have just a look and just where we are and why, you know, certain teams, you know, can't afford a loss and other teams are certainly just begging for a win. But North Carolina, like we mentioned, seven and no currently in the conference standings. They are undefeated in conference play. NC State and Florida State and Wake Forest sitting at the tie at the number two spot in terms of where their record is at five and two. Duke four and two, UVA four and three, Syracuse four and three. Nah, let's just keep it up there for now, right? These are all teams that I feel like have very strong standings. If we were to ask me right now, tomorrow, who's going to the NCAA tournament, I'd make a case for UVA and above. Mm -hmm. I'd make a case for them. Syracuse okay. and down, it'd be a little more tough, but still, yeah. I would love to have Syracuse in that bad boy. Teams you can't lose to right now. Just right. can't do it. Miami, and, Virginia Tech. Sorry. Teams oh, I no, feel no. like you can't lose to right no. now. Miami, Virginia Tech. But truly, it's the Notre Dame, Pitts, Georgia Tech, and Louisville's of the world. That's it at the bottom. Yeah. Boston College flirting right there with it. So, and let me say this, because I know people like to jump down Candace throat whenever she makes very declarative statements like that of like, hey, uh, you know, Virginia and above, I'd want to have a conversation. Syracuse and down, not so much. The difference is – all of those teams either have five or six conference wins or they have a win against the ranked team. Syracuse does not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a very clear factor in there to say like, oh, one of these four and three in conferences, 13 and five overalls is a little bit not like the other. That's why Duke is ranked seventh in the nation, despite being four and two in conference. Okay. <laughs> All right. Glad we got that out the way. You know, but, if I said the sky was yellow, people would really call me into question. And there was like the loon, the lunar sun and the moon and all the things, right? If I said definitively, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, if if you said the sky was yellow, I too would call you into question. Now, I think we would we would need to ask well, what's going on out there? You know what I mean? Is the end of times? Are they playing the trumpets? But um, the <gasps> the reality is, I'm not shocked at all by North Carolina being at the top. I'd have to pretend to be shocked there because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you didn't see multiple years of nothingness coming out of that program. Um, this is a, a basketball blue blood that, you know, they, they've got all the things they're known for getting it done. And, you know, they're, they're back atop that perch. Not really surprising there. NC State being tied for second. Very surprised. Not even going to hold you. Not even going to lie. And don't get me wrong. Their conference schedule only gets harder from where it is. But there was a question about how would this team gel? And if you would have told me NC State is going to be second in this conference, who's going to be the guy that's heading this up or who's going to be, you know, named the top four or five guys that are going to be heading it up? MJ Rice, the transfer from Kansas, would have been one of them. I would have thought, hey, 
he's going to be a superstar. He's going to be starting in his role if they're going to be second in the conference. He's seen very limited time, very <laughs> limited time, and that team has been okay. I heard he's out of shape. No, I'm just kidding, but, you know. You know, I, I'm just saying that team, they figured it out. You know, DJ Horn has been good. DJ Burns has been good. You know, they, uh, Ben if Middlebrook. you are a DJ, come to NC State. No, I'm just playing. Yeah, you know, uh, MJ's having a tough time in NC State, boy. I'll tell you what, Andy, are you okay? But with that being said, um, you know, Florida State being tied for second. I want to be surprised. But it's a lot I'm more season to go. It's yeah, it's a lot more season to go. And I, I want to be surprised, but I'm kind of not. Because yeah. we, we saw last year, the only thing that kept Florida State down, we talk about injuries on this show and one or two guys injured and out, whatever. Them boys had everybody who was supposed to be in the nose jersey was in a cast or a sling or something at some point in time last year. So uh, Wake Forest being time for a second, very, very sensible. The only thing that, that didn't make sense about it is that they got there while Monsanto was out. Now, that's the part that's like – because you got one of the best three-point shooters and distributors in the conference, and, you know, you're, you're doing it without them. It's very impressive there. Virginia, I'm a little surprised they're as bad as they are. And I know that we're saying, like, hey, they're in the mix, but a little surprised by that. And um, with, with that being said, Syracuse, that that sounds about right. Miami is probably my last surprise. Mm. Well, what I Miami is my biggest surprise because I just can't believe it's going this bad. But what I will say is I think there's something to be said about teams playing together. I know we're in this new age where NIL transfer, everybody's coming in and basically having, like, a – you know, bootleg free agency type beat, but it's something to be said about coming in staying with your brothers or guys who have stayed together longer, just figuring it out or just, you know, taking ego out of it. I think that's one of the biggest things. If you think about North Carolina right now, there's a lot of ego being taken out of while they're trying to flourish. I think for NC state, it's just hard nose play hoops, you know, have fun with it be to get like a band of brothers essentially. And I think that's something that gets lost in everything that we talk about every day with in terms of money and deals and da da da. Like do you just have fun hooping? Like you're playing a kid's game, you know? Not yet at King's Ransom type beat, but you really are just playing a kid's game and trying to do it at the highest level. So I think mm-hmm. it, if as we continue to see teams kind of get through it, it's how do they overcome the adversity together? How do they overcome hard stretches? Are you going to go on a three-game skid or things like that and be able to bounce back? So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, this is – this. there's a lot of season left, and I'm, I'm willing to bet you – I'm willing to bet, you know, donuts – or I'm willing to bet dollars to your donuts – that these rankings do look different at the end of the year. There's a lot of season to go. We saw this with football, where if we would have stopped at the midway point, if we would have stopped the count, it would have looked very different than it did at the end. But the, the reality is, <laughs> the reality is very simple. This is still a this is still a situation where we're just telling you what these teams have shown us so far. And I'll tell you, all in all, the ACC is a much stronger conference than people are giving us credit for. Yeah. Because when Kansas loses to an in conference opponent. Any night, anybody can get you in the Big 12 when Duke loses to a an in-conference opponent. Oh, the ACC is just falling apart, just embarrassing. <laughs> they lost in Cameron. How could they? To a lowly, terrible, oh basically D2 team. You know what I mean? I, that's, that's my big thing about it. At the end of the day, I think there should be more teams in the NCAA tournament or in bracketology than we're acknowledging right now, but we'll see once Selection Sunday comes around. Man, the accent makes me want to go watch Bridgerton or something, but we appreciate it. You know, can't wait for the the Tuesday action. All right, guys, tap into all of your favorite episodes. Make sure you get caught up. We got a lot more to cover this week. There are a lot of good games. There's some recaps from the women's side and all that fun stuff. So you don't want to go anywhere. We got some transfer portal talk. We got who's winning in the portal, who is really getting ready for some good spring ball coaching, trying to get all their alignments together to have a really good run in 2024 for the football program. So we're going to talk about that. Make sure you lock in for Candace Cooper and Kenton Gibbs. Until next time.